Hello Java programmers. It is a beautiful rainy day. Welcome to this pre-recorded version of our class meeting. It is week five. We are in module five on Canvas and we are picking up the few remaining slides from last week and continuing our discussion of conditional expressions. If you're following along, and I hope you are, this is the slideshow for Module 4. I am on slide 11. We spent last week talking about if-else expressions and the order of operations chart that we use to determine how an expression will be evaluated. We talked about logical operators and relational operators and how they can be used in an if-else expression. Another way to control the flow or the path of a program when it executes is to use a switch statement. Just like the if-else expression, a switch statement is common to many programming languages. Therefore, if you learn it here, you can use it in C Sharp and C++ and C and Python and all kinds of other neat languages. The switch statement is a way of replacing a series of if-else expressions with something easier to read and maintain. It's not anything new. Nothing new is added to the language here as far as control flow but it is a very useful construct when you see a bunch of if-elses chained together and this is a way to make that somewhat more straightforward. You could go your entire career without using a switch statement but that wouldn't be a good idea if you tried to shoehorn everything into an if-else construct. That would work for you but one of the problems you would face is that most of your job is going to be fixing other people's code, meaning adding enhancements, debugging, improving, adapting, and other people will have switch statements in their code. If you ignore them, it is at your peril, even if you don't think you need to use them. I use them all the time. They're wonderful, and they are an excellent adjunct or substitute for complex if-else expressions. This is a basic switch statement on my slide. I've created a variable called alpha. I assigned it the variable the value 42. You can see it's an integer. So I declared it and initialized it in the same statement int alpha equal 42. Then I build a switch. The switch is going to make a decision based on the value of alpha. That's the value in the parentheses there next to the keyword switch. And then it's going to drop into a case. So each of the cases could be considered an if. Only one of the cases will execute. If there is no default case, then it's possible that none of the cases would execute because sometimes you don't want to do anything depending on the value that you're switching on. In this particular example, we know because we can see the value of alpha is 42 that we will always go through case 42. And the syntax is the keyword case followed by some constant value, in this case 42, followed by a colon. Then we drop in some useful code, what we want to execute in the case that alpha is 42, followed by a break, which means I'm done, take me out of the switch. You may have seen the break before. That's also a way to get out of a loop. And we'll be talking about that shortly, probably next week. 
the break statement then another Java keyword that we can use to kind of for lack of a better term jump out of a construct and then continue on with the program in this example it's going to jump all the way down to the bottom of that switch and then continue out with whatever else is left in your code I am going to just take all of this code right off the slide I have already created a project I called the project switch expression I called the class switches and I called the package switches with the lowercase s remember we don't have a lot of context and sometimes we struggle to name things but this is pretty descriptive and we can live with it for now it won't be long before we're modeling useful things and we'll have useful names for our classes and projects and packages and all those things ignore this link for the moment I provided a reference to some computations that we'll talk about later probably on Thursday but I'm gonna go ahead and paste in that switch right off of the slide and it looks promising Eclipse hasn't squiggled anything there are no obvious syntax errors so whatever I had on the slide was syntactically correct I'm just gonna go ahead and run this it's not going to do much but it will run there are no output statements in this code it did run didn't crash didn't do much of anything but what it really did that we couldn't tell was it traveled through the 42 case and had there been any code there it would have done anything done something let's put some code in there let's just put a print statement in there whoops By putting that print statement in there, I'm going to generate some output to demonstrate that it does go through that case. There's the output. To make sure that it's not going through any of the other cases, let's just put in another print statement in the zero case. That will not execute. When I run the program a second time, it does not go through case zero because alpha is 42. And that's mildly interesting notice the cases don't have to be in any particular order so case 0 is tucked in after case 42 and then comes case 98 they don't have to be ascending or descending or anything like that it'd be nice if they were probably from a logical perspective but from a behavior perspective it doesn't make any difference something neat that we can do in the switch is what's called stacking in lines 22 and 23 I have case 98 immediately followed by case 99 that means that this code in line 24 yeah the code in line 24 will run if alpha is 98 or 99 I can create a kind of an or expression and at that point in line 24 I don't know which it is I don't know how I got there all I know is it is either a 98 alpha is either a 98 or a 99 so to prove that let's change alpha to 98 just go back up to line 10 edit the code instead of alpha being initialized to 42 let's initialize it to 98 and we'll run it again there's our output we ended up in line 24 I am cases 98 and 99 what happens if alpha is none of the cases let's put a minus 1 in there in line 10 alpha is now minus 1 well 
it doesn't match case 42, it doesn't match case 0, it doesn't match cases 98 or 99, but it does match the default case. If nothing else matches and there is a default case, it will fall through and execute that code. Given the conditions I have now, I know that alpha is minus one. Therefore, I know it doesn't match any of the other cases and I'm going to end up in the default case. There's my output confirming that. We can see then a lot of flexibility. We can stack cases. We can create a default case, which is our catch-all bucket. We can define a number of constant values. Now, if this starts to get out of hand, if you've got a hundred different possibilities for alpha in this case, you would have a hundred different cases, which would be kind of a disaster. I would say probably a general rule of thumb is keep it to 10 or 20. If it starts to trickle off the screen onto another screen, if you have to scroll up and down, you're probably not well served using a switch. That's going to come with practice. But keep that case, keep the number of cases low just to make the code readable. If you start to get a large number of cases, think about breaking it up into maybe a method call or something we haven't talked about yet. Again, that all comes with practice. You'll get a good feel for what readable code looks like as you write more code and read more code. One thing I cannot do with the switch in Java is I cannot make the case statement a variable. And the error I get is case expressions must be constant expressions. A constant would be a numeric value such as 42. It's never going to change. It's always 42, which is the opposite of a variable because a variable can have different values assigned to it over the life of your program. And that won't work. That's a syntax error. And that's easily caught by Eclipse. Eclipse expects a constant to be there. And that's not going to fly. Some languages will let you do that. But Java will not. Therefore, this needs to be commented out or deleted because it's just not possible to do. I'll just put a little note here. Can't have a variable in a case statement. I would just take that out usually. When I'm teaching, I'll leave it in. We can refer to it later. If I'm writing production code, I, I would certainly take that out. I would never leave that commented. I'm a big fan of preserving code, but I want to preserve code that works or has a shot at working. I don't want to put something in that I know is impossible and then, and then just comment it out. That, that's probably counterproductive in a production environment. Let's try something else. We like to experiment and learn from experimentation. Can we do a switch on another type of data? We're only switching on integers in this example. Alpha is an integer. What if I make a string The string is called test. It is initialized to hello in double quotes. So line 12, declare and initialize a string. And then can I do a switch on hello? Let's just open a brand new switch. Make some blank space here. Switch test. 
When I type in the opening curly brace, you may have noticed, and I press enter, Eclipse automatically adds that closing curly brace, and, and I'm off to the races there. And can I have a case? Hello? Can I have a case? Goodbye. Syntactically, I can. That is correct use of the language. I can do a switch on a string, and I can look for different contents of that string. That's pretty neat. Let's just add a comment to this. We can do a switch on a string, exclamation point. Hooray, that's pretty neat. How about another type of data? Can I do a switch on a double? Let's declare and initialize a double to $100.95. Let's try a switch on that. I built the basic structure of the switch as I did in the previous example with the string. Immediately, Eclipse is unhappy and it realizes this is a Java error. Cannot switch on a value of type double. Only convertible int value strings or enums are permitted. We haven't studied enums yet. Don't worry about that. We learned then from this, this attempt that we cannot do a switch on a float. That has to go away because we can't do it. Not possible. Moving away from that example, let's do another example together where we will do a more useful computation using our switch. I have created a new project through the magic of editing. I have a project called Quality Point Calculations. In that project is a package called Quality Points, lowercase q, and I spelled points wrong. So watch this. If I edit the name of the package in the code, I get an error because the package name doesn't match up with where that file resides anymore, but it's easy to fix because Eclipse will move that file to the package name that I put in. And let me just reiterate what I did. I did it accidentally, but it's a good lesson for us. I misspelled points, quality points. And if you look at the package name, the package name is also quality points misspelled. If I correct the spelling in the code, in the class file, qualitypoints.java, I automatically get an error. Eclipse underlines that because the package name as declared in the file we're editing no longer matches the package where that file actually lives. So, it offers me the option of moving that code to the, to the correct package name. And watch my Project Explorer over on the left. It's going to create a new package in this project. Doink, there it is. In the project now is a new package called quality points spelled correctly and then there is that file that class file that I already created it moved the file to the new package and now the only problem is I have an empty package here that I had misspelled I can delete that the packages in an Eclipse project map directly into f folder names on your drive so just think of this as a file structure. And this quality points misspelled is a empty folder that needs to go away. I can select delete and it's gone. 
now I'm good. I have quality points spelled correctly as the package name and quality points declared correctly as the package in the file. So you may have noticed that URL that I had in the earlier example. I just moved that to another project to give us more room to talk and have less cluttered space. Now the way I found that URL, if you're frantically trying to type it in, is I just went to the search engine and typed in quality point UC Cincinnati. <clears throat> and then the very first hit is a page from our registrar that explains the calculation of quality points. If you don't know what those are, they have a dramatic effect on you because your GPA is based on quality points and the number of credits that a course carries. A three credit course gives more quality points than a one credit course. So you should put more work into the three credit course obviously because it's three credits because it has more of an impact on your GPA and your GPA is driven by what le letter grade you get which is mapped into a number called quality points and then multiplied by the number of credits that that course included so the computer needs to know how to take letter grades which you earn at the end of the semester and convert those into these numbers. And that sounds like a really good opportunity to create a switch. And as a programmer, you'll get better at this. You'll look at this web page and you'll think as a programmer thinks and you'll realize, wow, I've got about 20 things here that are brief little one or two character strings. And those individual 20 things need to be mapped into numbers that might be a good opportunity for a switch. There might be other opportunities to map it in using arrays and some more dynamic data structures, but a switch is a good start for us. Let's take a shot at this. Our goal then is to start with some letter grade, A, A minus, B plus, B, B minus, and end up with a numeric value representing the quality points for that letter grade. And that would be a really useful algorithm to provide to people who are in the registrar's office so they can compute grades. And we've made our first, first cut at doing this. We created a project. I pasted in the URL. That means when I come back in a year and look at this, I'll know where I got this information from. I did not make up the quality point mappings. I didn't make up the grade letters. They're all right from the UC Registrar webpage. That's a really good comment to have in there because that's a trail of breadcrumbs that you can use or other people can use as well when they come to modify this code. If your code has a bug in it, if your code is needs to be modified to include other types of grades, or enhanced in other ways, this is the place where people can go to see how you got where you are. Highly recommended that you always think about providing as much information as other people would need to understand your program. And this is a prime example of that kind of commenting. Imagine if you came to look at this code in a year or five years and you would think to yourself, where did I get those numbers? Where did I get quality points? Where did I get grade letters? And here's the place that they originated. That makes everybody's life a lot easier. I am going to start a switch. And the thing I'm switching on is going to be a string because these grades are obviously strings. They have letters in them. They have plus and minus symbols in them. If you scroll down, there are a whole bunch of other letters you might not even be aware of. There's an incomplete grade. There's an incomplete failure grade. There's a UW grade, which you read about on my syllabus. I caught at another school in Cincinnati, we had a V grade with no, I'm not making this up the the grade was V and I asked my uh, boss what it stood for and he said it stood for vanished 
they signed up for the course and maybe they came once and then they never came back so we gave them a V for vanished and it turned into an F it was zero quality points and it was bad news on their transcript but the faculty got a big kick out of that, that we had a V grade to use if we liked. I know I need a string. I'll just come back here and I'll say string final grade. And that's going to be A, B, C, D, whatever. And I'll put a value in there. Final grade equals. Let's start with an A. We'll have to come back and put different values in there to test our program and see how well it works. And then I need a switch because I've got to somehow map letters into quality points. And I could do that with a bunch of if else expressions. If grade equals A, then do this. If grade equals A minus, then do that. But that gets really uh, clunky and challenging to read and the indenting goes crazy and pretty soon you're off the right side of the page because you've indented so much. Therefore a switch is a much better way to go here. And let's drop into our switch. Switch final grade. So far so good syntactically. Eclipse is happy. There are no Java syntax error so far. Now we need a bunch of cases. And the cases are all these grades. A, A minus, B plus, B, B minus. I'm not going to put all of these in, but I'll put some in. A, break, case, B, I'm sorry, A minus. break, case, B plus, break, oh I put a semicolon in there instead of a colon, there we go. Make sure you get that symbol correct, that's a colon following the value of the case, not a semicolon. And you may notice, and this violates the rule that I gave you earlier about indenting. Every time you open a curly brace, you should indent one tab. And it didn't do that. The, the default format in, in Eclipse, the Eclipse code editor, doesn't indent these cases. But I do. I come back and do that. And then that follows my rule. Every time you open a curly brace you indent and then every time you close a curly brace you do the opposite of indenting which is actually called outdenting that's really a word it does exist and then inside of each of these cases I'm going to assign a value representing quality points I need a variable for that all of these quality points have to be stored somewhere Let's go back and create a variable, and this is part of programming, is to recognize when you need to use a variable. What kind of variable should this be? Quality points. Well, since I look at this column, the quality points column on the web page, most of them are floating point numbers, 4.0, 3.667, so on. There are some that are NA. I'm a little con concerned right now because I'd like to make this a uh, double. I know I'm going to do math on it down the road. However, there are some that don't get quality points at all. They don't even get zero. They get NA. I'm going to ignore that for now. I'm going to call a meeting of everybody involved in the project and we'll have a spend six hours discussing this, how to represent NA and we'll pass emails back and forth and write memos and call more meetings and come in on Saturday and text each other and eventually we'll decide that it should be a floating point number and we're going to put a zero in there instead of NA. But to bypass all of that stress right now, 
I will just put in a double here. Each of these cases then needs to have a value assigned to quality points. Notice right now that I declared this variable and I immediately get a warning. The value of the local variable is not used. Okay, that's correct. I have declared it. However, I have not done anything with it. That's okay. I just haven't gotten there yet. I'm about to. That means sometimes you'll get a warning and you know that that warning is is legit but it's going to go away very shortly as you type in more code. Quality points equals four. I don't need to put in all the zeros. I can, it's fine, 4.000, but those are implied. They're not necessary. If it makes you feel better you can put those in. Someone's going to tease you about that because it is redundant and unnecessary. Well, they get four quality points if they got an A. What if they get an A minus? They get 3.6667. 3.6667. Six, those decimal point places obviously are necessary because they're not zeros. And then we'll do the last one, which is B plus 3.3333. Ah, wrong one. There we go. You can see how that would continue. We would continue adding cases to this. The letter grades are easy, but then we get down to some more interesting like audit where there are no quality points. We have to make some command decisions and talk about how to process that grade letter. For the purposes of this discussion, we won't worry about that because the implementation of the algorithm is not really our concern here. It's more the structure of how to write the code and how to use a switch. But eventually you as a developer would build cases for all of these grade letters. And next week when the registrar added another grade letter, V for vanished perhaps, you would come back and you would modify this code to support that grade letter. For now, let's say that we're not really sure the registrar is on the up and up and things could change that they might not tell us about. We're going to put in a default case. We're going to say, hey, what happens if the registrar codes in some grade that we don't know about? A new grade got added to the system, but we didn't get the memo. That's the default case. We can just, at this point, let's just print a message at least. And I am going to make this message a little more friendly by printing out the final grade that I don't understand. And this is the most rudimentary way of handling some kind of unrecognized data error. This is an input error or a data error or a processing error, whatever you like to call it. It would require a lot more thought to handle this properly. Do we need to log a message to a data file? Do we need to print something? Do we need to light up a little light on the screen? Do we need to give the user an electric shock? I mean, there are many ways to think about that. But at the very least, we can print it out. And as you get better at programming, you'll understand and you'll realize somehow that for better or worse, this error condition here may take up more of your time than all the good data put together because you have to break out of normal processing and decide what to do. And that takes time and thought and effort. 
we have something now that's pretty workable. Notice the warning is still there on quality points. I did declare it in line 8. Java knows it's a double. I put a value into it in line 13, 16, and 19. But Eclipse is still not happy because I haven't finished the thought yet. I haven't printed it out or done anything with it besides put values into it. It's like creating a bucket, putting something in the bucket, and then never dumping it out, never making use of what's in the bucket. Just carry it around with something in it, and then eventually the program ends and you haven't used the bucket. To make the error go away, then let's just, just print out the quality point value. The error, the warning, uh, if you spell it right. Okay, what's it unhappy about? Oh, all right, different warning. Good deal, good deal. We can talk about that. What it's saying to me now is that, yes, I declared it. It knows it's a double. Yes, under some circumstances, I put a value into it. But what if it doesn't go through any of the cases? What if it's not an A, an A minus, or a B plus? If it doesn't go through any of the cases, if your program skips all three of those cases, then this thing has never been initialized. You never put a value into it explicitly. And that's what that warning is. Notice it says may not have been initialized because some code paths will initialize it and some code paths will not initialize it. Therefore, to make that warning go away, let's just put a zero in there. That way, even if I don't see an A, an A minus, or a B plus, I will still know that there's a zero in quality points. That's a reasonable initializer. If you look at the chart again, there are a lot of outcomes where the quality points is a zero. You might also make this minus one and that tells you that you didn't go through any of the cases if you end up with a minus one. So there's kind of a way of telling yourself that hey none of the cases matched because I ended up with a minus one. So let's leave it that way. That might be useful for us. We're ready to run. I've got a program with no syntax errors. And it, it starts out with a little bit of data. It does a little bit of processing on the data. And then it prints some results. And that's, that's all you can expect a program to do, is take some data, process it, and generate some output. Let's see what we get. Well, we know what we're going to get. Final grade was initialized to A, therefore it's going to go through this case. And then assign the value 4 to quality points. Drop out of the switch. Remember this break statement right here in line 14 is going to take us all the way down to line 25. Okay, that's the bottom of the switch. And then it continues on executing where it finds this print statement and it tells us what the quality points are. We have some confidence now that it probably works. It looks reasonable. After lunch, we have a long lunch. We eat some pizza. We talk to our friends. We surf Reddit for a half an hour. We can come back and we can add in all of these other cases. We can also use this switch as a wonderful opportunity to illustrate the debugger. Remember the debugger is the most important tool you will have as a programmer aside from your design documents. Syntax errors are easy to fix. If you spell something wrong, Eclipse tells you about it. That's easy. It's highlighted in red. You get a description of what Eclipse thinks the problem is. Eclipse has detected this is a Java error of some kind. 
quality p quality y points cannot be resolved to a variable. You haven't declared anything called quality y points. That's a typo. Easy to fix. Fix the spelling, you're good to go. If you don't have enough braces, or perhaps, heaven forbid, you have too many braces, now you got a problem because the braces don't match up and Eclipse tells you they don't match up. This error is not as easy to fix as the one we just saw with the misspelling because what it wants to do is add another brace, which really isn't what you want to do. You want to get rid of the extra brace and that makes the error go away. Those are syntax errors. Those are easy. Logic errors are hard. That's what the debugger is for. The debugger is used to step through the code, to set breakpoints, to evaluate intermediate values of variables, and figure out why in the world your program doesn't do what it's supposed to do. You have a design document, you have an algorithm, you have pseudocode, and your program does not produce the desired results. Why not? Well, it's time to get the debugger going. And you've got to force yourself to do this. It will make your life infinitely easier. It will teach you infinitely more about the code than you could ever learn in a class. And you can solve problems. I'm going to do an illustration of the debugger. Even though there is no logic error in here, we can still use it to study the code and see how it works. I'm going to set a breakpoint on line 10, and that involves just double clicking in the margin. Remember how easy that is. A little icon lights up. If you hover over that little icon, it tells you that it's a breakpoint. And you don't even have to do that because you know that little blue icon is a breakpoint. That doesn't change your code at all. It doesn't affect the logic. It doesn't change the syntax. But if you run it in debug mode now, it will stop on that line of code and you can step and examine and study and do all kinds of neat things. Remember when we run and we want to stop on that breakpoint, instead of clicking the green run button, the little green arrow, we click on the bug. And this is an homage to a very famous computer programmer, Admiral Grace Hopper, who was around in the very early days of programmable computers, who helped create a language called COBOL, which is still in use today, has a bug named after her, and many other things named after her. She was a great lady. But the origin of the term bug, and there's some debate about this, but what they say is that the mechanical computer actually got infested by a moth, so they had to debug the computer by taking that moth out, and then the computer started working again. And that's why we say to this day we're removing bugs from our programs. And the world of hardware is a little different than the world of software. Hardware engineers are trained to maintain logbooks, handwritten logs, for different reasons. And you can see in this log entry on the web page that I'm showing you, they actually taped the moth to the log entry. It was stuck in relay number 70, which is just amazing to have been there at that time in history when computers were the size of a room and included tons of mechanical parts, relays, and they had to be maintained constantly because mechanical parts break down. And now our phone does a thousand times more than that computer ever could do. That's why we call it debugging. I have my breakpoint. I'm going to start the program by clicking the bug. takes a little bit longer. 
I didn't do anything except click the bug. You may have gotten a message on your screen if you've never run the debugger that said, do you want to change the perspective? I suggest that you say no and then check the box that says remember my decision. That's up to you. Again, if you get a dialogue that says, do you want to change the debug perspective? I say, say no and also check the box that says remember my decision. I just think the debug perspective opens a lot of cluttered windows at this point in our process. Uh, down the road, those windows will become very helpful to you. Right now, there are just too many things to look at. But I started the program in debug mode. It started to run. It got to the breakpoint, and it paused. My program is now kind of in suspended animation. It's waiting for me to do something before it's going to continue. Instead of zooming all the way to the bottom and generating output, it stopped. The line that's in green has not yet been executed. It's waiting for me to tell it what to do. It's executed lines 1 through 8. Those have already run. Line 10 has not run yet. Now, I can hover over variables. Watch how powerful this is. If I hover over quality points, it tells me the quality points has a minus 1 in it. If I hover over final grade, I haven't put anything in that yet. But line 10 will put something into final grade. How do I run just line 10? I only want to run that one line of code. Well, in the Run menu, there is Step Over. That means execute the line in green. Step right over it and execute it. Make that selection. Now line 11 is highlighted. I executed line 10. If I hover over final grade, it's got an A in it. You can see how powerful this is because I can watch my code run one line at a time and I can very carefully examine the values of all the variables. I can also see what code path it goes through. I can see that it steps over and jumps into the A case and then jumps all the way to the bottom and executes line 26 and all that becomes very clear to me just by step 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 even if your program works this is a very good way to learn about execution flow and just get a visualization of what your code is doing if you've never seen the code before if I gave you this code and it was completely new to you you could run the debugger on it and just step through it, step, 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 and see how it works. Very powerful tool. Every modern programming language comes with a debugger. It's part of the development environment. We call it the IDE, Integrated Development Environment. Our IDE is Eclipse, and, I, and Eclipse knows how to execute Java programs. When you start going out for job interviews, you'll get asked the question, oh, I see on your resume that you've had, that you've had Java. What IDE did you use? That's the term that we use. You will be asked, what IDE did you use? And your answer should be, I used Eclipse. The worst thing you can say is, I don't know. Under help, about, Uh, waiting, waiting, there it is. We're using Eclipse, looks like 4.17 or version 2020-09. And that's mildly interesting. It's just a modern version of Eclipse. You probably won't get asked that question. An interviewer won't be too concerned about the version of Eclipse. Some programs, the version number is significant, but Eclipse, as long as it's a modern version, you're probably okay. But you do need to have that answer at hand. You will be asked, what IDE, did, what IDE did you use? And your answer is, I used Eclipse. We are still in the midst of debugging. We know that for two reasons. If you look in the console window, there's a red button that's lit up that says terminate. Look at the bottom of my screen. The terminate button means that your program is in the middle of executing and you can kill it if you like by clicking terminate. It's like the red button on your VCR, but nobody knows what a VCR is anymore. There's also a red button in the button bar at the top that also does the same thing, terminate. 
that means you as a developer have to keep track of where you are. You have to realize that you are debugging your code and that you have to get out of it if necessary or continue stepping if necessary. Eclipse also lets you do this. Run it again. You can run it more than once at the same time. That's very confusing and do not do that. We are nowhere near ready to do something like that. It also gives you a little visual cue if you hover over the run button. It does say already running. Therefore, if you are paying attention, you can realize that I don't, probably don't want to run this twice at the same time. Let's continue our process. We are in the pro we are debugging, so we are on line 11. Line 11 is in green and it's not yet been executed. It's going to make that switch based on the value of final grade. We know that's an A. We just do run and then step over again. And it jumped into the A case right there. We went from line 11 to line 13. We're assigning a value to quality points. So far, so good. Let's do another step over. It assigned the value. It fell down to line 14. It's waiting to execute line 14. You should know by now that from line 14, it's going to go to line 26. It's going to take us out of the switch. Here we go. Run. Step over again. Down to line 26. Print line 26. Step over again. The output appears in the console window. We're at the bottom of the main method. There's the closing curly brace in the main method, which means the program is almost done. It has nothing left to do except terminate. Step over again. And it ends. The terminate button goes away. There's nothing to terminate anymore. The program has finished and we are out of debug mode. We learned a huge amount about this program by setting a breakpoint and stepping through it one line at a time. And I encourage everybody to take the time to do that. Even if you write a program that works, it has many code paths and it's very useful to learn how to step through it and observe the code path that it's taking. That's our end of our discussion today. I hope it was useful, and I will see you all in the next class. Thank you very much.